Welcome to episode number 10 of the Bridge C14 podcast. It's Lauren Clark, President and CEO. I'm pleased to be joined by Cynthia Clark as she shares part three of her maid story entitled, Will He Die at Home? Cynthia walks us through the journey leading up to her husband's death, the emotions that accompanied the experience, the challenges in managing the role of wife, mom and caregiver, as well as the couple's commitment to truth, honesty, and transparency with their children. Thank you again, Cynthia, for sharing with all of us. And to everyone listening, thanks for tuning in and supporting the work of our organization. Will he die at home? Will the kids be there? Will he die at home or be transferred to a facility for the procedure? How do you envision the end? What's the best case scenario? A nurse asked gently, trying to help me think through the logistics for his last day. I was not able to answer. The truth is, I did not want to envision it. I can't. I can't conjure up an ideal scenario for the worst day of my life. I don't want to. This is absurd, I responded. It was like those ridiculous questions my kids asked me. Mommy, would you rather eat my poop or her poop? Mommy, would you rather step on nails or run through fire? Mommy, would you rather get shot or stabbed? The answer was no. Do you want to die at home or in a facility? No. What date do you want to die? No. Who do you want to be with you when you die? No. The answer is no, no, no. Hell no. I'm not going to plan this. I can't, I sobbed. But I had to. His medically assisted death was just a few days away. It's really strange to know the date that someone is going to die. I couldn't help but feel like I was supposed to facilitate a series of perfect moments, fulfill a bucket list of curated activities accompanied with Polaroid snapshots of blissful smiles and loving embraces. My mind conjured a Hollywood-esque vision of children's Miracle Network footage against a backdrop of tears and laughter, all set to melodramatic Time of Our Lives music. It didn't take long for the sound of nails on a chalkboard to interrupt my fantastical ideations, forcing me into a reality check. We had two young, active kids grieving with us. Everyone was tired and overwhelmed with the weight of his death day looming. I was anxious and finding it hard to sleep. My mind constantly wandered to thoughts of the end, of after, of the funeral, of life as a widow, of life as the mother of two fatherless kids of my capacity to support their grief on top of my own. My husband was sleeping 12 to 16 hours a day, and some days his legs didn't work. He was ready to die, not film the next Kumbaya family movie for the Disney Channel. During this time, I wanted to be fun mum, or patient mum, or silly mum, but all I seemed to succeed at was bitchy, angry, tired, and sad mum. It felt like I was failing, and I couldn't imagine where I was going to get the energy to help my kids through the worst of it. It wasn't Hollywood, but during his last few days, we did find ways to spend meaningful, though usually brief, moments saying our own version of goodbye with some, but not all, of the people in our lives. My husband was steadfast in his desire to reserve the best time, the most time, for his kids. He wanted to tuck them in every night, to cuddle as long as they tolerated his drooling and snoring, and to infuse them with his love and his memory. He relied on me to be his gatekeeper, his time watcher, his bad guy, so that he could love his kids for every second possible before he left us. One of his passions was watching our kids play sports, so no matter how badly he was feeling, he always made sure to attend their games. The last game our daughter played before he died, he proudly watched in person, seated in his despised wheelchair, covered in blankets. It was magic to see both their faces as their eyes connected when she scored that day. I don't think I've ever seen 11 moms and a few dads cry, happy cry, at the same time. Unsurprisingly, the days leading up to his death day became harder and way more emotional. The tears flowed frequently, and I found myself trying to delineate between reality and fiction. How could this be happening to us? Maybe we should have waited a few little longer, a few more days or weeks, one of my children suggested. But we knew he was ready. 
And in the grand scheme of things, a few more days or even a week or a month were not going to monumentally change our experience. He liked to point that out to anyone that stopped by, using sweeping arm gestures followed by his thumb and index finger squeezed tightly together in front of his nose, that we are merely a speck of dust in the billion-year history of the universe. What was a day or week, really? Will the kids be present when he dies? Will he die at home or be transferred to a facility for the procedure? We decided that he would die at home. Actually, my husband thought he should die elsewhere so that he could protect us, meaning the kids, from bad memories of him dying in our home. I reminded him of our commitment to truth, honesty, and transparency with our kids. We talked about death being a natural part of life and that we didn't have to present it as something scary. I shared with him my worst-case scenario, how unnatural it might feel to have to take a taxi, or worse, an ambulance to their father's death appointment. Wouldn't it be more scary to arrive in a sterile hospital room and sit on a cold, hard, vinyl-covered chair across from a standard hospital bed in a generic beige room that smelled of old people and Lysol as they watched their dad prepare to have death administered? What if they change their mind and want to leave the room? Will they sit in the hall, alone, while you die? Or will a nurse help them unpack their iPad and choose a show to watch while their dad dies? If they're not comfortable, they will want their mom. They will want me. I will be forced to choose between holding and comforting my children or holding my husband while he dies. We decided that they should be given the choice over how much or how little they wanted to participate in his death. <clears throat> Being at home would give them the flexibility to decide in the moment, to change their minds and still feel supported. At home, they would have their toys, their bedrooms, their people, and any comfort they might crave, all accessible to them. With this decision made, we invited our friends and family over to help us turn our spare bedroom, formerly his office, into a beautiful space for him to die. We wanted him to be surrounded by symbols of love, photos of the people who loved him, and things that represented who he was. We gathered up his favorite books, pieces of our kids' artwork, family pictures, Lego creations, and sports jerseys, and decorated a space just for him. The night before he died, the four of us stayed up late finishing the Harry Potter book we had been reading as a family. We ordered takeout from one of our regular restaurants and had a cozy family dinner in bed. By this point, our master bedroom had become like a second living room, with many guests crawling in to sit beside my husband and have short visits. When I finally made it to bed that night, on the day before he died, he was already sleeping. This was not uncommon. That was how he spent the majority of his time by this point. I cuddled up to him, trying to relax, noticing how unremarkable this moment felt, considering its monumental significance. This was my last night as my husband's wife. Wasn't it supposed to feel more memorable, more special, more like the night before his brain surgery 10 months earlier? I clearly remembered that night. That night and the hours leading up to his awake craniotomy were etched on my memory. I had stood outside my children's bedrooms, just beyond eyesight, <clears throat> but not out of earshot, listening to him tuck the kids into bed. I was holding back my tears feeling the hot pressure rise through my sinuses as the corners of my eyes filled with heat. Silence. I'd peeked through the crack in the door. He was holding them so tight. I remember willing him not to worry them by making this too dramatic, trying to send my wishes across the room in a way he might receive them. Let go, please, let go, I had whispered to myself. Two weeks earlier, we'd found ourselves at the emergency room where he had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Instead of undergoing emergency surgery immediately, he'd been stabilized and sent home to get his affairs in order and spend some quality time with his family. The surgery he would have the next day was supposed to extend his life from three months to 12, but there was no guarantee that he would come out of surgery the same as he was. I remember going into the bedroom that night to join the family hug, reassuring my kids that saying goodbye, just in case, wasn't rude or unkind. My husband's tears had started to flow then, hearing them say goodbye to him. 
I wanted to tell them it would be okay, but that promise was not mine to make. This was a goodbye of sorts, although we didn't know the extent of it yet. It takes a while to realize that the time you are chasing is never the same quality of time that you once knew. Hours later, as I waited patiently with him in the hospital, I had pulled up my big kid pants and gave my terrified husband a pep talk instead of the Ativan that he needed. 95% of these surgeries go fine. We're scientists and we believe in numbers. The odds are in our favor. This is a great bet. It was true. The surgery had far better prognosis than his illness. We were prepared. We had signed our wills, discussed his wishes, dutifully handed over his green sleeve, the packet of documents declaring his wish to not be resuscitated or intubated, and the form giving me his medical power of attorney. We had agreed that if something were to happen, he didn't want to carry on, alive but not living. He'd asked me to check the box for no religion on the admitting forms. I knew the passwords to the important accounts and had the rest saved in a meticulously organized file that he'd painstakingly created the week before. He'd told me that he wanted a cremation and nothing extravagant. Don't spend too much money, he'd said. When the nurse had come to take him into his surgery, I'd reminded him of his favorite saying, planning is everything, plans are nothing. We have a great plan in place. Hopefully we won't need it. His eyes had overflowed with tears as he transferred his thick platinum wedding band onto my thumb for safekeeping. I'll give it back soon, I'd said with a smile. You will be back home next week to tuck the kids in, I'd promised, as I pulled him in close for one last hug. He clung to me that day with an intensity I'd felt only twice before, when leaving each of my kids at daycare for the first time. It was the most cherished hug of my lifetime. I laid next to my husband's weak body the night before his death and realized that this should feel unremarkable. It was different. He was more anxious than nervous, more resigned than hopeful. I didn't feel the desperate fear, the desire to stay, or the clinging of a man with goals, an unfinished business. I lay there that night and summoned the feeling of that cherished hug from ten months earlier. I wrapped my arms tightly around myself and I sobbed. Desire, hope, and determination were mine now. I felt a strange comfort in this contrast. I was tired, sad, and broken, but also confident that we were making the right choice.